and I welcome you all now to our program, Election 2020, How to Be an Education Voter. And as I said earlier, we're going to have a representative from Expect More Arizona, also from the County Recorder's Office, and from our own Community Legislative Network. So I, um, just before we start, uh, I just know that you are going to be very focused on everything that you're going to be hearing and it's going to be super engaging and great if by chance you come up with a question you want to ask you can put that in the chat also um, every once in a while if you want to glance over to the chat we will try to drop in some uh, website links and other resource links that uh, should be going along synonymously with the program so um, just be aware of that if you want to keep your eye on the chat and also we did put together a resource document that you can find um, here there. We sent it out earlier and it's also gonna be in the chat and that's gonna give you links to information about how to check your ballot and check your voter status, how to find out your legislative district, who is on, who's running in your district and uh, what the initiatives are that you should be looking at. So um, please take a look at that after today's program. Again, we'll put the link up. Uh, so you can go ahead and uh, copy that down or um, we'll probably put it out a few more times on our Facebook page, I presume. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Donna Davis, who is the Senior Community Engagement Manager for Expect More Arizona, which is a statewide nonpartisan organization dedicated to ensuring that every Arizona child has um, access to an excellent education, which we know is very important to all of us here at UPC. And they are focused on the early years all the way through college and career, which also is something that is important to us. We often talk about uh, career readiness and uh, getting kids started early. So Donna has over 30 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. She's devoted most of her time to organizations that focus on youth, education, and workforce development. And uh, please join me now in welcoming Donna Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Can you see my screen and can you hear me? Perfect, Donna, thank you, yes. Okay, yay, all right, good. Okay, well, I am thrilled to be here with you tonight and I'm thrilled that Lisa called and asked me to do this because I hadn't done this um, presentation actually in a little bit and every time I do it, I'm reminded of things that are important to know. So I hope you guys will learn something tonight during this presentation. Um, let me start out with what we do. We um, bring diverse groups of people together to find and implement solutions to Arizona's most pressing education issues. We are an education advocacy organization. So we send out advocacy alerts and we have a huge network that I'm also going to talk about tonight. You know, education is totally an economic driver. If you um, add up all the money that we lose um, from students that don't graduate from high school, and if we take a look at ROI for every um, student that's enrolled in pre-kindergarten, for every dollar we spend in early education, the ROI, the return on investment is $7 per student. Um, we also lose a great deal of money to our, from our economy by students that are um, between the ages of 16 and 24 and are not working and not in school. That costs us about $96 billion. So education is definitely an economic driver for our state. Whoops. Um, it also strengthens communities. It protects property values. It reduces crime rates. It's a determinant of public health. It's also quite often a determinant of voting behavior. Um, ed more educated people are more likely to vote than less educated people. Um, and it reduces the reliance on social safety nets. We live and die by this document right here. It's called the Arizona Education Progress Meter that um, we did in partnership with the Arizona Center for the Future, who has progress meters for a lot of different issues. Um, and years ago, in 2015, we were asked to lead the effort for the education progress meter. This, um, metric, this document gives you 
eight metrics that we measure on it or that we update usually on an annual basis. So this was updated in January. And this gives you statistics for the entire state of Arizona. You can go into our website and look on the progress meter and you can pull up statistics for your own school district. Um, you can pull them up for your own town. But this tells us that um, you know, only 22% of our um, three and four year olds are in a quality early learning experience. 41% of our eighth graders are proficient in math. 13% um, of our 16 to 24 year olds are opportunity youth, meaning they are not working and not going to school. And I just talked about them as part of the economic driver um, slide that I just talked about. 55% of our students enroll in a post-secondary um, uh, experience after, for after they graduate. So underneath each of these goal, each of these statistics, you'll see a goal. And we set these goals for 2030. One of the most important was our attainment goal, which is very um, concerning to the state because today's workforce requires that 70% of people have some training beyond high school. And our attainment rate of training beyond high school as a state is at 46%. So there's a lot of effort going on around the state to increase that particular statistic, but we recognize that we can't get anywhere um, in that statistic unless we improve all the rest of the statistics. So I would urge you if you have questions to go into our um, website and, and look at the Arizona Education Progress Meter. Whoop. We do have one of the largest education advocacy networks statewide. We have over 350 partners to include schools and businesses, um, all kinds of nonprofits. And then we have over 80,000 individuals who um, connect with us either on Facebook or through our, through our email system. And then we have 45 cities and towns that have issued proclamations in support of our organization and that attainment goal that um, was set. And then we, we work with Achieve 60 Arizona was started um, in, as an answer to our um, dismal attainment statistics. So we work with them in the work around attainment for our state. I wanted to give you an idea of voters in our state. This slide depicts the percent of um, the population in 2019 by various ages. You can see that our population in Arizona, it's actually getting younger. So the highest uh, percentage of population belongs to the age group of 25 to 34. And then, uh, but we also have a big jump in people 65 to 74 in our state. So this, uh, this column right here. So this kind of shows you the ages of our population. And then this um, for 2016 shows you um, the number of people that registered to vote in that age, the number who voted, and uh, the total population for that age group in 2016. So um, you can see the last slide was the percentage of population. This is, you know, the numbers of population. In 2016, um, only 35.8% of 18 to 24 year olds voted right here. Um, but 67.8% of those 65 and older voted right here. So um, as a rule, um, older voters vote more often than younger voters. And in working on my own bond and override election and with various um, people who, who manage bond and override elections, um, I have learned through the years that only about 15% of our parents vote. And that is a sad statistic that we really need to work on. This slide shows you in 2018, which, is, which was an off season year, you know, there wasn't a president running for election or anything, the governor was, but um, this shows you one of our biggest problems. Um, this is the number of people on the top that voted for in the primaries. 
And a lot of times the people who win the primary end up being our representatives. Um, in my district, for instance, I live in a very red district. We don't even, we have one uh, Democratic candidate in my district for this upcoming election out of three. So, um, so we are very red. Whoever the Republicans are usually that win that primary will be my next representatives. Um, and, and it's that way in a lot of our districts around Arizona. So we need to have more people turn out for this primary election because by the time you get to the general election, it's almost too late. Um, so, uh, so it would be helpful to have more people turn out for the primaries. So this um, graph kind of depicts, this org chart depicts what our education system looks like. Um, and we're gonna go into some more detail, but um, basically our education system is kind of run by, or you know, the policies are determined by a statewide first things first board that manages our early childhood funds for the most part, our state board of education that manages the policies for K-12, and our board of regents that manages the policies for the state universities. Um, the community colleges have their own group of presidents that meet, but they're not an official state organization um, for our state. But now we're gonna look at some of these other things that are um, depicted in this org chart. Um, usually during elections, there are a lot of um, candidates that influence um, education. I'm admitting somebody. <laughs> um, and um, our, our, you know, our governor affects education um, the school, the state superintendent for public instruction influences education. Um, our legislators affect education, that's for sure. But as I think most of the public understood after this COVID thing, our local school boards have a lot of influence on education in our state. Um, along with um, candidates for election, we also usually have district bond and override um, initiatives and ballot initiatives that impact statewide education policies. Whoops, whoops, wait a second. So while the governor is not up for re-election this time, he does have an impact on education. He's elected, well, he or she is elected every four years. And so uh, Governor Ducey has two more years on his term and then he will be termed out. Um, so he sets the initial budget for our state, which includes education funding. Um, he kind of sets the tone for the state. Um, initially in this slide, I had that the, the whole leadership team for the state, like the Secretary of State's office and um, while the state superintendent of public instruction, that they were all Republicans. But that did change the last time around um, in our last statewide election. The superintendent of public instruction is Kathy Hoffman, uh, as I'm sure you all know. And um, that, that office distributes education funding to the LEAs, to the school districts. Um, she does serve as a member on the Board of Ed, um, on the Board of Regents, and on the First Things First Council. She directs the work of the employees at the Department of Ed, and she executes the policies that the State Board of Education comes up with. This is really important to understand. Um, she is not up for election this time either, but will be in two years. But the reason this is so important to understand is because we have a lot of candidates for this position who run on a platform of what they're gonna do. Um, and I can give you an example. I'm gonna get rid of Common Core. Well, you, you don't have that authority. You have to work with other people to, uh, to do that. So this person really, um, you know, directs the work and, and implements the policies from the state board, but doesn't make up the policies for the most part. Whoops. Um, this time we are, however, electing our county school superintendent. And that person's major role, and the reason they're so important is because they appoint governing board members if there are vacancies. Um, I don't know that it happens so much here in our county, but in other counties around the state, um, a lot of times there aren't people that even run for the school board. So someone has to be appointed to those positions and it's up to the county school superintendent to, um, to appoint people. 
Um, so they submit reports for the, to the state superintendent of public instruction. They are responsible for all the school district elections. So the bond and override elections are run through the county school superintendent's office. The school board elections are run through the county school superintendent's office. Um, so um, they report income and expenditures for school districts. So they really do have a big influence on education. Oh, no, that's right. Okay. Our legislature has a huge influence on education in our state. We have 30 legislative districts. Each district has two representatives and one senator. So currently in the Senate, we have 17 Republicans and 13 Democrats. Now that, you know, after November 3rd, that could change. And when the new session starts in January, um, all of these numbers will change. Currently, we have 31 Republicans and 29 Democrats in the House. So that that race right there is really important to the state um, because it will just take one more person, one more Democrat to shift the, the balance of power in the House to even Stephen or two to make it a different majority. Um, the Senate is run by the Senate president who right now is Senator Fan. The House is run by the, um, by the, pre uh, by the Speaker of the House and currently that is Rusty Bowers. Um, each house has an education committee. So right now in the Senate education committee, we have six Republicans and three Democrats. In the house education committee, we have eight Republicans and five Democrats. Um, Senator Allen heads the Senate education committee and um, Representative Udall heads the house <coughs> education committee. So um, and we, we function on an absolute majority to pass bills, and that's 50% plus one member to pass a bill in our state legislature. Our legislature is a, a part-time gig, supposedly, um, and, the, and approximately for 100 days. <clears throat> it, the um, session starts at noon on the second Monday in January when the governor delivers the state of the state address. And then typically they can adjourn for the last time sine die after passing a budget. Now this year was completely different than most years. They passed a budget, <clears throat> but they did it in a hurry. We call it the skinny budget. Um, there, there wasn't a whole lot of room for negotiations or additions or um, any of that kind of stuff because they did it quickly in light of the pandemic. So after signing die, that they can be called back um, for a specific person, um, and they're usually called back by the governor, and that's called a special session. And uh, you may have heard a lot of talk about um, our legislature being called back for a special session, but the governor has not agreed to that, and members that are um, upset and want to have a special session um, don't seem to have the momentum behind them to get enough members to join them in having a special session. So that has not happened yet. And I haven't talked to anybody who thinks that that will happen before the election. So the governing board member, like I said, <laughs> this position has been really highlighted during this pandemic because they not only hire the superintendent and look at curriculum, and manage school property and discipline students and discipline teachers and oversee the budget. Right now, they're the ones making the decisions on when can we open school? Um, what kind of um, you know, structure will we have? Will it be you know, all in-person, all virtual, half and half? What days will people, will students be allowed on campus? All that kind of stuff is um, determined at the governing board member level. And so um, through this pandemic, I think there's been a lot of focus on the governing, the role of the governing board member. We have this, um, this sheet on our website under our Vote for Education uh, um, part of our website, and it's available for download if, if any of you wanna download this and give it to any of your friends. Um, but on our ballots, usually, and you guys don't have one this year, but we usually have um, bonds and overrides, which, as you know, provide local funding for local schools. 
It's a part of your property taxes. It can be implemented in all kinds of schools to include community colleges. And bonds build new classrooms, MO overrides pay for staffing, um, all day kindergarten, and then district additional assistance can pay for bus, you know, kind of big capital expenses that aren't buildings. So um, those are also on some ballots across the state. Um, and then this year we have two ballot measures. Prop 207 um, is proposing to legalize the possession and recreational use of marijuana for anyone that's 21 or older. And it creates a sales tax on the, on the sale of that. And it requires um, the Department of Health Services to regulate those businesses. And it's gonna fund community college districts, police and fire departments, and the highway user fund. And then the big, um, the bigger controversy seems to be Prop 208, which will increase income taxes to those making, uh, and individuals making, it, and they're not calling it a tax, they're calling it a surcharge. For those individuals making $250,000 a year or $500,000 a couple, and it would distribute funds to teachers and education. So, 50% would go to compens compensating teachers and for classroom support personnel. And then 25% would support student support personnel like transportation and aids. 12% um, would go to CTE, 10% to teacher mentoring and retention, and then 3% to our Arizona Teacher Academy. So who are we voting for this time? We're voting for a lot of people. At the federal level, I'm sure you all know, we're voting for our president, we're voting for our senator, and we're voting for representatives in Congress. At the state level, we're voting for our state senator and our state representative. We're also voting for corporation commission members. At the county level, we're um, voting for our county supervisor, our assessor, our county attorney, our county recorder, the county school superintendent, the sheriff, and the treasurer. At the school level, we're um, voting on community college boards. We may be voting on CTED boards, which are JTED boards, Joint Technological Education District boards, school governing board members. And then there's a whole slew of judges on the ballot for us to vote on. If you go on our website, which is um, expectmorearizona.org, and you go up here, it says our work. And if you click on that, at the bottom of that list, you'll find vote for education. We've been doing this campaign since we started 10 years ago, and we break our work for Vote for Education up into four different categories. Sign up, study up, speak up, and show up. So, um, so this is the, the, the landing page for Vote for Education. And then um, you can find who your elected candidates are all the way down to your school board members um, if you go in and fill out your information on our, on our website. Under study up, there's a lot of information. Um, it has questions to ask your candidates, and I've used these uh, questions actually before in some candidate forums that I've been a part of. Um, there's a list of bonds and overrides for every district in the state, who, who, is, who is having those, um, and it's listed by county. Um, there's also the 2020 school board candidates are in there for each school district across the state also listed by county. Our community college candidates are in there by county, along with a way, for the most part, that you can connect with them. Um, the green piece of paper that I just showed you about how your vote makes a difference with the org chart on it, that's in here as well. Um, the state of education today is, is in here as well. So there's a lot of information on our website, and I would urge you to go there to check out what we have. Okay, I'm struggling here. With... Okay, so here are the key election dates. Um, this first one got changed yesterday. <laughs> um, October 23rd was supposed to be the last day to register to vote. Um, and then yesterday that, that date got um, changed through the appeals court. So now tomorrow is the last day to register to vote. Um, our ballots started being mailed out from the county on October 7th, so hopefully you've already gotten yours. And in-person voting could start that day too at voting centers around our county. The last day to request a ballot by mail is October 23rd. The last day to mail in your ballot is October 27th. And then uh, November 3rd is the general election. 
If you have not signed up for the elections text or email subscription at recorder.maricopa.gov backslash subscriptions, I would urge you to do that. I love it because it tells me when my ballot was mailed to me. When I send my ballot back in, it says we've received your ballot. It says we're checking on your signature, your signature, and then I get a text saying your signature has been verified, your vote has been counted. So all along in the process, it tells you exactly where your ballot is. And I, I totally love that. And if you need more information about any of the um, stuff for this election, you can go to Be Ballot Ready, which is also at the Maricopa Recorder's Office. So the biggest thing we need to do is to vote. And we especially need to get more parents engaged in the process and urge them to vote. So, um, so that's my big message today. There's my email address and my cell phone number, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, my name. Thank you so much. We have um, a couple quick questions for you, and then you gave a wonderful introduction to uh, our next speaker who's coming directly from the county recorder's office to go over again, once again, go over some of those uh, websites and dates with us to make sure that we all know exactly where to go and what to do so that we can have our voices heard and especially our voices on education issues, which is what we're talking about today. So um, I have just two questions I uh, want to share. Uh, the first one that was sent in, um, it's not specifically to the uh, election issues, but uh, one of our members has asked um, if you happen to know um, whether the Arizona education system has seen any negative effects from the federal dollars provided for COVID relief. Uh, for example, did the state withhold other monies due to education because of the CARES Act? And if so, how can we correct it? So Lisa emailed me this question earlier today, and I'm really thrilled that she did because I wouldn't have been able to answer this if she had emailed me earlier. So I checked with our leadership team, and I want to read to you exactly what the president of our organization said, who's very knowledgeable about budget items and legislation and all that kind of stuff. So she said, there hasn't been any withholding of funds like back in the Great Recession where federal dollars filled or bridged the gaps left in the state funding formula. But we did pass a skinny budget and some COVID expenses are probably issues that should be supported in the long term by state dollars. Um, like computer hardware, software, connectivity, PPE, um, all that kind of stuff. Not to mention we're paying the price for running our schools on a shoestring. Hybrid learning in some instances means one teacher is teaching kids live and online at the same time. We haven't had the, PD, the professional development to help teachers transition into the new modality. So while that money has, the COVID money has not been used um, to supplement the budget, keep in mind that, we, the, that the legislature passed a skinny budget and hasn't been back to work since then. So those are all issues that we need to keep on our radar for this next legislative session. One other question that came in for you, and it was about one of the propositions and I was trying to clarify which, which one. So I will just ask you uh, in general, um, whether Expect More Arizona has taken any positions on any of the propositions on our ballot and if you wanted to uh, briefly share that with our members. Yes, we have taken a, 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 a position of support for Prop 208. Um, I do have to tell you, it, we're not being real, real vocal. We're not front and center in that support because um, there was a lot of discussion um, among our board members about our support of that proposition, basically because we are a P20 organization and this proposition addresses K-12. And we feel really strongly that we need to, you know, we continue to come up with band-aids to support um, education funding. And we need to, at some point in time, stop and take a look at the entire system. So we are supporting it though. And um, so, so that's our position. Okay, thank you. And um, that, uh, 
attendee also um, did get back to me and she wants to know specifically whether um, Expect More Arizona takes a position on uh, Proposition 207. No, we don't. We stick with the, with the ones that influence education and 207 does give some money to the community colleges, um, but unless it, you know, really affects education, we don't, we don't take a position on it, so. Okay, well with that, I really want to thank you for joining us. We are going to move to our next speaker, but um, if you want to stay on and listen, we would love to have you and perhaps some more questions might come up for you um, in the next 20 minutes as we continue. Um, but I will now bring on our next speaker. Her name is Melissa Davis, and she is coming to us from the County Recorder's Office. And I want to just let everybody on here know that we are really, uh, really um, in a great position. We're very lucky to have our County Recorder and his whole staff. They have been working really hard, I know, to make sure that we all have our right to vote protected and everything in place. And um, you can follow them on social media and see what they're doing. You can see cameras uh, everywhere, how they're checking the um, the sites and you can see cars going through dropping off ballots you can uh, make sure that um, with your own eyes that everything's on the up and up and that machines are being checked and uh, we are good to go so um, this vote by mail is not new to us and i can tell they're working hard to make sure that it's as smooth and as great as it can be so that everything uh, works the way it should so i turn this over now to melissa davis thank you melissa Hi everyone, um, my name is Melissa Davis, as she said. Um, I'm the Youth Outreach Coordinator for the Maricopa County Reporter's Office. And I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about um, what your different options are for voting in this election. And then I'm also guessing I'm gonna get some questions about the voter registration deadline. Um, originally when I got this reason, uh, the request for this presentation, it was for about five minutes. So, um, and I did get a request for some extra information, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but if at any point you have any questions about what I'm going through, please let me know and I will do my best to answer all of those questions. So today I'm going to go over the different options for voting, the voter registration deadline, and some of the resources that we have. I know some people have mentioned the text messages, so I'll go over that as well as be ballot ready and everything like that. So in this election, you have multiple ways that you can vote. You can vote by mail or you can vote in person. If you're going to vote by mail, you can either do a one-time request for a ballot. So if this is the only election that you'd like to vote by mail, if you usually like to go in person, you can make a one-time request. But you can also request to be added to our permanent early voting list. And if you are on the permanent early voting list, you might hear people call it Pebble or Peeble, depending on what part of the state you're from you'll be mailed a ballot automatically for each election that you're eligible for without ever having to request it. And so you can drop the ballot off. You can also mail it back. Um, we have a lot of different ways that you can uh, return your ballot. And then um, if you decide that you would like to vote in person, you have multiple options for that as well. We have early voting, which opened last Wednesday on October 7th. And then we have voting in person on election day. One thing I would like to mention for this election, I know a lot of people, even if they get their ballot by mail, they like to hold on to it and take it into the polls so they can get their I voted sticker. But this year we're actually including stickers in all of the mail-in ballots. So you don't have to go in to um, just get a sticker this year. It'll actually be in your ballot envelope on the instructions page. And so if you are going to vote by mail, we have a few different um, reminders for everyone. So as someone mentioned earlier, the ballots did start being mailed out last Wednesday, October 7th. We did mail out over 2 million ballots this year to voters. So they didn't all go out on October 7th. Um, some of them went out on Thursday and Friday, but we had a lot of ballots to mail out. Um, we do tell people it can take up to a week for those ballots to be uh, delivered by the U.S. Postal Service. So if you haven't received your ballot yet, I wouldn't necessarily panic yet. Um, I would still give it a few days, especially if your ballot was one of the ones mailed on Friday. But if for some reason you haven't received your ballot, you can always request a replacement from our office as well. The last recommended date to return your ballot by mail is October 27th. So 
if you are going to send it back, um, we recommend the earlier the better, but that's the last recommended day to do it. If you do mail it after that date, it may not get back to our office in time through the mail. So if you have it after October 27th, um, we actually recommend dropping it off at one of our ballot drop boxes or at one of our vote center locations. It's also really important that you sign the back of your ballot. So the signature area, that's how we determine that this is in fact your ballot and you are the one who voted. And so we compare your signature to different signatures that we have on file for you. So we might have one from the Arizona Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, we might have one from your voter registration. Whatever we have on file, we use that as a comparison to make sure that you are in fact the one casting this ballot. And then we also highly encourage you to put a phone number on your ballot when you're turning it in. So if there is any ever any question about your signature, if you know, maybe you broke your arm and your signature is a little shaky or maybe you have an illness or something like that. There's a lot of reasons why signatures change and we don't ever dismiss a ballot outright just because the signature might look a little bit different, but we will contact you to try and resolve that issue. And so if you put a phone number down, that's going to be the easiest and quickest way for us to contact you. If you choose to vote in person, we have lots of locations available. Um, we are doing a staggered opening. So locations started opening last Wednesday um, and there will be progressively more locations open through November 3rd. You can go to locations.maricopa.vote to find your closest voting location. Um, this year we are doing vote centers, which means that you can go to any location that you like in order to cast your ballot. You don't have to go to a particular assigned location like you may have had to in the past. So you can pick like an, a location that's close to your work, a place that's close to your school, whatever works best for you, um, you can choose that location to go to. If you are going to vote in person, you do need to bring ID with you. So there's a lot of different types of ID that you can use. If you have an Arizona driver's license that has your current picture and your current address on it, that's all you need. You just scan it when you check in. But if you don't have that, then there's a lot of other options that you can use. We actually have three different lists of IDs that are valid to use in an Arizona election. And we usually tell people that you need a combination of different documents if you don't have a photo ID with your current address. One of the best ways to find what type of ID would work best for you is to go to azcleanelections.gov and they have this tool that'll actually walk you through the whole process. I work a lot with college students and a lot of them don't have driver's licenses. A lot of them don't have utility bills. So this is actually a really great tool to go through and see out of that whole list of things that we accept at the voting centers, what you actually have and what you should bring with you. So this is actually a really great resource, even though it's not ours personally. <laughs> and then of course we have all of the important deadlines. Um, <laughs> we did make this graphic before all of the voter registration deadline um, changes happen. So of course the voter registration deadline has changed, but everything else on this list is still correct. So um, ballots did mail out last week. Um, October 23rd is gonna be the last day to request a ballot. So this is if you would like a one-time ballot for this election or if you need a replacement ballot. So you know, say you spilled your coffee on your ballot or you have a really rambunctious puppy like my mother does who ate her ballot the other day and now my mom's needing to get a replacement. Um, but whatever your situation is, or say you have to go out of town unexpectedly and you need your ballot mailed to you there, you need to get those requests into us by October 23rd. And then on October 24th, we will have weekend and in-person voting available. And then October 27th, as I mentioned earlier, is the last recommended date to mail back your ballot to make sure that it gets back to our office in time. And then of course, November 3rd is election day. One of the big things um, that's a big difference between Arizona and other states is that we're what's called a ballot enhanced state. We are not a postmark date or postmark state, <laughs> sorry. So if you are voting on election day in person, you must be in line to cast your vote by 7 p.m. We actually have a poll worker position called a line, or sorry, a marshal. And when 7 p.m. happens, our marshal actually comes outside and stands in the back of the line of voters and says, this voter is the last person allowed to vote tonight. 
Um, so if you're running late and you're parking in the parking lot and you walk up at 702 and we've already closed the line, you will not be able to get in line to vote. Um, so please, please, please make sure that you are in line before 7 p.m. If you're voting by mail, um, it's the same deal, sort of. Um, as I said, we recommend that you mail your ballots back by October 27th. But regardless of how you choose to get that mail-in ballot back to us, whether that's putting it in the mail, dropping it off at a voting center, we must have it in our custody by 7 p.m. So if you are running late and you just wanna drop your ballot off, that's totally fine, but you need to make sure that you're in the voting center before 7 p.m. to drop it off. We won't accept anybody walking up at like 7.05 p.m. with their ballot in hand, unfortunately. So in order to make sure your vote is counted, please make sure that you have the 7 p.m. deadline in your head. And then um, there is a lot of um, discussion over the voter registration deadline. So originally the voter registration deadline was on October 5th, but um, third party groups did sue in order to have that deadline extended due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Originally the extension was until October 23rd at 5 p.m., but there was an appeal of that decision and the new voter registration deadline is tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. So we will continue to accept voter registration forms up until the deadline tomorrow night, but if you are waiting or if you know someone who's waiting to send in their voter registration, please make, encourage them to do that as soon as possible because we want to make sure that we have enough time to process those forms before the election to ensure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. Another thing we also want to encourage people to do is make sure you hold on to the receipt that you receive from your ballot or sorry, from your voter registration. So if you do a paper registration, there's a carbon copy receipt on the back of the um, voter registration form that you can keep. If you do your voter registration online through Service Arizona, they'll send you a confirmation email. Please make sure that you hold on to those, um, those documents because if there is any question over your voter registration, those are gonna be the first documents that we ask you for. Of course, the situation is very fluid. Um, I personally didn't find out about the voter registration deadline change until about 1130 last night, but the best place to keep up to date on all of this information is going to be register.maricopa.vote, where we'll keep all of the information about the voter registration deadline, how that's going to affect ballots um, and everything going forward. Um, but if you do have any questions about this, please let me know. And then um, just so you guys are aware of the different types of ways that you can register in light of the deadline, you can register online at servicearizona.com. It's the same place that you do your um, vehicle registration, get your license, all of that. Um, if you do decide to register online, it does require a, a Arizona driver's license or state ID in order to do that. You can also drop off a paper form at our office um, at 510 South Third Avenue. Um, if you need to provide any kind of documentation um, to prove citizenship apart from a driver's license or a state ID, dropping off that documentation with your paper form is gonna be the quickest way to process your form. You can also register to vote at a vote center. Um, if you do that and then you choose to vote right after, which is a possibility, you will be issued what's called a provisional ballot. So. I know a lot of people get concerned when they hear the word provisional ballots, but I can promise you, we count every, every single ballot for every single election, including provisional ballots, as long as we can prove that that person is eligible for the election. So if you, are, if you do register to vote at the vote center, um, we just haven't had a chance to process your form, which is why you'll be issued the provisional ballot. But once we've able, been able to process that form and verify that you are in fact eligible for the election, then we'll actually go ahead and process that provisional ballot the same as we would any other ballot. And then of course, I did wanna mention some of our resources. So I know this is everybody's favorite part of the election, figuring out who actually won. Um, so we'll start posting results from the election at 8 p.m. on November 3rd. Under Arizona law, we can start counting ballots 14 days prior to the election. So um, we'll start tabulating ballots on or around um, October 20th. And then that batch of results that you see at 8 p.m. on election day are all of those early ballots that came into our office early. 
And then once we start getting all of the different results in from our vote centers, from our ballot drop boxes, we'll go ahead and run those through our tabulators and update those results as soon as we get them. Um, I believe they do like unofficial updates every couple hours after the, for each day after the election that it takes to tabulate the results and then do an unofficial full count at 7 p.m. each day. So um, we'll be um, processing those as quickly as possible. And then we are required by law to present all of the election results within 10 days of the election. So um, you won't have to wait a long time to get all of the final results. They would just have to be approved by the Board of Supervisors and then by the Secretary of State's office, um, what we call the official canvas. And then we do have a website called theballotready.vote. It's kind of your one-stop shop for everything that you need for an election. It'll show you your current registration status, where you register, your party registration, if you're on the permanent early voting list or not. It'll also show you all of the information about your upcoming elections. So, um, for example, some of you might have had multiple elections this year, depending on where you lived, um, that you were eligible for and had multiple ballots coming for it. It'll also show you your ballot status. So um, this runs similar to the text messaging program that people mentioned earlier, but it'll show you what the status of your ballot is at every step of the process. So when it's been mailed to you, when it's been received by our office, when it's going through signature verification and so on and so forth. And then uh, we do have online signups for the permanent early voting list this year. This is a brand new thing this year. So if you'd like to sign up for the permanent early voting list, or if you'd like to make a one-time request for a ballot, you can go to request.maricopa.vote. Um, this is also where you would make a temporary address request if you're gonna be out of town and you need to have your ballot mailed to you. Um, so when you go in, if you can sign up for the permanent early voting list, but if you wanna do a one-time request or a temporary address request, you're gonna check on the one-time request box. This is the code that you can text um, to get information about your ballot. So you can text JOIN to 628-683 or go to text.maricopa.book. It will ask you some confirmation um, questions just to verify your identity. But then once you do it, it'll send you text messages for every single election. So I usually get, um, I've been signed up for a couple years now, I think since 2017. And I have text messages going back all the way to 2017 talking about the different um, status of my ballot. So it'll tell me when my ballot is being prepared for each election and when it's been mailed to me all the way through um, until my ballot has been signature verified and counted. And then of course we have all of our different resources. Um, we have our social media accounts, but if you do ever have any questions, um, you can email voterinfo at risk.maricopa.gov or you can go to 602-506-1511. Um, that's our main telephone number helpline. Um, it's open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. But if you ever have questions specifically about youth outreach or anything like that, you can also feel free to contact me directly. Um, my job in the office is doing a lot of youth voter registration, youth civic engagement and education. And I'd be happy to help any of you out um, with any questions or concerns or programming that you have. Um, but other than that, Thank you so much for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Melissa. I have a question uh, just for you when you were talking about the, I know as the mail-in ballots come in, they're being signature verified. And then I believe you said they can start being counted 14 days before. Can you just tell us what that means? Is there someone that's seeing it or is it somehow kept secret so no one sees the results ahead of time? Um, so I, are you asking about the signature verification process or the results process? After they've been verified, when you start actually counting, what does it mean okay. that they're, they're counted? Are they scanned and is that stored somewhere? What does that, what, what does that mean? So all of our ballots are tabulated in our ballot tabulation center. So that's um, this super secure room um, that's under 24 seven surveillance. And all of the ballots are stored and counted in that area until the election is complete. Um, only a certain members of our, our staff are in there. I definitely do not have access to it. Um, and they go through the whole process. 
Um, in the prior to that, that tabulation period, they're all kept in secure storage. Um, we actually have what we call the ballot cage, where it's um, kept under police, and, or sorry, not police, but um, kept under watch by the Maricopa County Sheriff's Department. For the, um, for the results themselves, they are never released publicly until 8 p.m. and they're not even really released internally <laughs> until 8 p.m. I definitely don't, wouldn't see any of the results until the public does as well. Um, only certain members of the staff have access to that to ensure the security of the election because we want to make sure that we follow state law and federal law to, for every step of the election um, to make sure that the results are accurate and that there's no question over the election itself. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I can tell in the chat, getting a lot of uh, positive feedback and comments for everything that you've shared and that uh, Donna has shared with us today. And before I let you go, I'm going to uh, quickly introduce our next speaker, but I'm going to ask the two of you, uh, Melissa and Donna, if you could stay on for just a minute. And before Lisa starts to talk, um, there's a question that came in that we're going to see which of you, because um, I don't think it's directed to any one of you in particular. So <laughs> while I still have you, we're going to bring on Lisa and then ask the next question. So um, everyone, you know and love her. This is Lisa Hoberg. She is a parent here in our district and she chairs the Superintendent's Community Legislative Network and she's going to uh, say hello and then she's going to give us some information about how you can stay engaged in the process and continue to uh, use your voice to support education even after the election. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? And then can Jessica help me with my slides? Okay, before you start your slides though, I'm oh, gonna ask a question. I just wanted Sorry. to get you on and so everyone could see you. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about, especially at the beginning, um, how elections impacts uh, schools and school funding. And a question came in about how the elections are funded and whether oh. the school districts uh, bear any of the costs to run the elections, uh, particularly the ones that uh, we said that the uh, county superintendent might run uh, for the, the governing board and the bonds and the overrides. So uh, the question came in, uh, if there's a cost to school districts for this, and um, if that is impacted by the number of candidates and whether there are any writing candidates. So... Does I just want to speak to that. I can answer part of it, at least at the county level. Uh -huh. So um, we, so under state law and under federal law, the county reporter has uh, jurisdiction, or I guess like jurisdiction over elections here in Arizona or in Maricopa County, and so we administer the elections um, based on those laws. Um, generally, we run. I guess what you would call like jurisdictional elections through statewide and national elections. So we run the primaries, the general elections. Um, we do also do um, kind of special elections as well. So if there's a special election, like a special congressional election, if there's a special um, bond over, or sorry, maintenance and bond override election, those are some of the ones that we um, generally run. And we don't, as far as I know, the cost is handled at the state legislature level as part of their budget. So um, some cities may ask us to run their elections for them. And if they have an elections budget, then they'll reimburse us for the cost. But generally for any election that's part of the um, statutory requirements under Arizona law, we have ways to um, handle the cost and we work with the state legislature on that. That's interesting. I, did, I actually yeah. didn't see that. Donna, do you have any information on that? I think that the school districts have to contribute to the elections, especially if they're doing bonds and overrides. And actually, I think even for school board candidates, um, I just talked with a superintendent or somebody from a school district who was saying that they um, had all of their um, school board vacancies filled and at the last minute, a write-in candidate came in. And so they had to run an election then because they had, uh, you know, over the number that of seats that they had available. And he, he said something like it, it was going to cost their district $700,000 for that election. 
and I think it's for the printing of the paper, you know, the ballot thing, you know, with, with the statements for pros and cons and, you know, all that kind of stuff for, um, especially for bonds and overrides. But my understanding is, is that yes, school districts do have to pay somehow for, for these elections. Lisa, your opinion? Yeah, I, I was actually in a meeting where this came up um, and I, I do remember what Don is saying that it is a little different than what Melissa is saying. I mean, in most cases, by all means, I mean, it's not like a legislative candidate's gonna go pay to have you know their name on the ballot or anything, but um, for school districts, um, the, jurisdictionally, it is a little different. And I think it has to do with the number of registered voters in the school district. So it's actually like some amount of cents per registered voter that the district has to pay the elections department um, in order, you know, to run the election. Um, and, a, and also a little differently though, um, if uh, say for legislature compared to governing board, like if there's only one candidate for one seat, that legislator will still be on the ballot. However, with the school board races, similar to if anybody really knows anything about precinct committeemen um, for the both of the different parties, if there's only the number of people that run, um, that's the quota for whatever's open, whether it be number of school board positions or the quota of precinct committeemen in a particular precinct, um, the election will be canceled and nothing will be on the ballot and therefore for the school district there would be no expense incurred so I will sense. also add that um, depending on the type of candidate that's on the ballot there's different there's actually like different rules on how each of those candidates can actually make it to the ballot so for example there's different rules for partisan races versus nonpartisan races um, Lisa mentioned precinct committee men we don't if there aren't enough um, people running for precinct committee men to force a challenge, then we don't actually put those on the ballots. We only put those on the ballots if, you know, there is an actual um, competition between the two. But that the rules for, say, example, precinct committee men are very different than the Arizona State Legislature candidates. Right. Right, but governing board in that aspect would be similar to precinct committee men. The election could actually be canceled if there's not a contest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hopefully that thank answered. you. I, I just want to jump in because it's it's five thirty, and I know we want to get to Lisa, and we're hoping I can you be fast. On, she's going to be fast. Um, but I just want to, um, while I can, thank our other presenters one more time. Uh, one more time, you definitely can stay on if you need to run. We totally understand, and we really appreciate your being here. I also want to direct everyone's attention to the chat. There was a. Uh, some more information on the last question that was posted by one of our uh, UPC reps who, I don't know if she put it in herself or if her husband, who is our current county superintendent, posted it. So there's a little more information uh, there as well. And uh, I now turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. All right. Um, just again, thank you so much to Donna and Melissa. That was awesome. And I just think this information is so important. And I, um, you know, as Donna mentioned, I really do hope everyone picked up something from this. And if nothing else, I just would encourage you to take the information and share it with a neighbor or share it with a friend or, um, you know, put something out on Facebook that shows your I voted sticker. Just really encourage, you know, try to make sure that everybody um, gets out and votes. But so really quickly, just a few things to follow up on that really like takes it down to our school district level. We kind of were at state and then we kind of went to county. Now just a couple um, points for our school district. Um, these are our legislative candidates that are running in the legislative districts um, in our that overlap with PV school district. Um, and I believe that we have this basically pasted into that resource that was linked at the very beginning that is a, a like a Google Doc that has all of the links in there. And the names that are underlined are actually live links so that once you go to that document, you'll be able to click on those names and it'll take you straight to their campaign website. So um, should be hopefully a helpful way for you to do a little research um, if you haven't already. Um, but as you can see, for example, Donna mentioned, we have a very similar situation in um, one of our legislative districts. Um, Nancy Bartow 
I mean, essentially is, is uh, running unopposed. Um, I, Matt Smith doesn't have a campaign site. And um, so I don't think many people are really even aware of that, but um, she won the primary. And so therefore we'll slide right on through to being elected um, in a few weeks. Um, fairly, you know, but the house on the other hand, two Republicans could be two Democrats, but just one Democrat. Um, in LD15 and then, you know, you see it's kind of a mix of, of either kind of full ballots or less full ballots um, throughout the other legislative districts. Um, something to point out, I just think in general, I saw a question on Facebook that if you don't vote at all, or if you vote for one, when you could vote for two, does it somehow spoil your ballot? And um, I know Melissa can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, no, that would not spoil your ballot. You do not have to vote for anybody on, you know, you could vote for one person on your ballot and send the rest of it in and that person would still get that vote. So um, for whatever that's worth, I think it's kind of a, an interesting um, thing to confirm. And Melissa says, yes, that's correct. So, um, I mean, I guess because there's really only a couple more things. Is it, before we move on, uh, any questions about our legislative races? Okay, so I think I'll keep looking, but let's move on to the next slide. Um, so as we review, hopefully this um, these next two slides will look really familiar. Yes, L let me just go back really quick because great point, Donna. Um, make sure you vote all the way down the ballot. In fact, I was in another meeting the other day. Um, and heard somebody say, suggest, start on the back. Start on the back and start at the bottom and go up and then you know flip it over the front and start at the bottom and go up and um, make for sure that, um, you know, even though you don't have to vote for everybody, um, it is just as much of your voting right to make for sure your voice is heard at every level. Um, so I'm not suggesting that you don't, I'm just suggesting that your ballot won't be spoiled if you don't. Um, uh, Jessica says she started with the judges perhaps because you have that legal experience. That, that section overwhelms me, Jessica, so I might need to give you a call. I haven't filled out that section yet. Um, so yes, vote, vote all the way down the ballot. Because a lot of times, sometimes, especially like our, the things that affect our school district governing board races or um, some of the propositions or when we have our bonds and overrides, those tend to be at the bottom of the ballot. So um, make for sure that you look it all over and don't forget to turn it over, exactly, right. Um, awesome. Okay, so again, um, I'll just move on. Uh, hopefully, again, these next two slides look familiar to many of you because we go over it a lot during um, bond and override election years. Um, we as parent groups um, have some like do's and don'ts really that we need to be aware of, um, primarily because most um, parent groups are 501c3, so that tax status actually gives some parameters. Most of you will find that your bylaws also um, have some pretty specific um, do's and don'ts um, when it comes to then it is a little different based on um, uh, propositions um, and versus candidates so parent groups can vote to support a ballot issue so again different than candidate but a ballot issue um, such as a bond and override or really even um, 208 for example um, they can spend up to 15% of their time and resources, um, in, you know, including money on, you know, political activities that support those things. But you, you do see that it definitely is a, you know, capped at a fairly low, low percent of your budget. Um, they, of course, advocate for the ballot issues within their membership. Um, utilize electronic forms of communication with election information as long as the school districts are not utilized. And you remember that's something we talk a lot about, um, you know, and we'll talk about that on the don'ts. It can't be um, all, through any sort of district email addresses on any sort of district um, hardware, software, uh, any clearly any property, uh, buildings, school board, or, or um, uh, like tech boards or anything like that. Um, but again, parent, as long as any PTO or PTA things are there, have their own separate Facebook pages or websites, you know, that's separate from district resources. Um, and as well as invite speakers um, that would give information about um, those 
uh, ballot items, uh, political action committees. But with that, even with that, as you'll remember, um, you heard this from me probably a lot in the past, um, those, when that happens, those organizations or representatives actually have to pay our community education department in PV school district for the time to, um, that they are, um, well, really actually when they're on property. So, um, so that's how that goes. So um, we'll move on to the cans and then see if there's any questions. So Jessica, thanks. Um, so, but a little different. Parent groups cannot actually endorse candidates. Um, they absolutely can't send election materials home with students. So, you know, no putting flyers or um, information pamphlets in backpacks. Um, use a school website to advocate for an election outcome, which is exactly what I talked about um, a minute ago. Ask school district employees to advocate for election when they're working. So again, as you can imagine, district resources is also district employees on the clock time. Um, and then as well as displaying any advocacy merit, uh, materials on, again, any district owned equipment, flyer on the PTO bulletin board within the school, so on and so forth. Um, so Melissa, let's see, wait, let's just go through here real quick. Um, you make a mistake on your ballot. Oh, yeah, good. that's a great point. Melissa um, Davis mentions, if you make a mistake on your ballot, you can request a replacement. Um, I think you can do that either and get it back via mail if you have enough time. But if you don't have time, um, Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can actually just take it into one of the in-person voting centers. You can even take your spoiled ballot. That's what I would do personally. I'd take it right into the voting center. They'll um, like, I don't know what to say, like deregulate or deactivate, I guess, your old spoiled ballot and they can print you a new one um, assuming you're at a voting center or voting location that can do that. Uh, mistakes. So, go ahead and chime in. Sorry, that's correct. Um, if you need to get a replacement, you can go to a vote center and they'll void or cancel your old ballot and issue you a new one right then and there. Perfect. So Julie asked real quick, Melissa, stay on if you could. Um, uh, if you accidentally put a mark in a box and then vote yes, for example, will it invalidate that question or the entire ballot? That's a good question. So if you, if you mess up on one item, does it just invalidate that line item vote or does it invalidate everything else you've, you've actually marked correctly? So it would only invalidate that single question. Um, in order to invalidate your whole ballot, you'd have to like, I don't know, have a kid like draw all over it with crayon or spill coffee on it or something like that. Um, but it would invalidate that single question. Um, we use central tabulation machines in order to tabulate ballots. So they process anywhere between six to 8,000 ballots an hour. But if we get a ballot that has an error on it, so say you marked two bubbles in a section that only was supposed to have one bubble, so like for a yes or no question, that would actually get flagged and that ballot would be, I don't know if spit out is the right term, but it would be separated from the rest of the ballots. Mm -hmm. And then that ballot would be re reviewed by our ballot adjudication board where um, staff members from two different parties look at the ballot and make a determination on the intent mm -hmm. of the voter. Mm -hmm. So. That's not to say like if you make a mistake, like for sure it's going to be counted the way you want it to, but it will have a second set of eyes on it. But if you do make a mistake and it's on a race that you really, really care about, I would strongly recommend getting a replacement ballot. Can I ask you one more question? And I hope this isn't too crazy because I know it's a little bit of a, an interesting topic right now, but we land, I know that there was um, at I think during our primary election, we could cross, like if we made a mistake, we could like cross out the name. And this may be kind of to your point, like if we were to cross out that name and then mark the bubble of the name we wanted. So if there was a bubble marked with a crossed out name and a bubble marked without a crossed out name, the, maybe the point would be they would have a better chance of knowing you intended to vote mm -hmm. the person whose name's not crossed off. But then I heard, they were not allowing that. Do, do we have? <laughs> um, so there was there was a lawsuit involving that. Um, yeah. The 
So the thing is, is if, it, if your ballot does make it to the adjudication board, they do your, the best that they can to determine what your intent was. So if you cross something out, then we obviously know that that's not what you wanted to vote for, but voters aren't always super clear that way. Um, right. Some people do um, all different kinds of things to their ballot. Um, what we would recommend right now is to just completely request a replacement yeah. ballot if, if you are concerned at all, especially if it's something that you really care about. Like, for example, if you guys are voting on the propositions, I know one of them is an education one. If that's something that, you know, you you have really strong opinions on and you make a mistake on that, please uh, request a new one because we do want your vote to count yeah. the way you want it to count. Definitely. Awesome, thank you. Okay, last slide. Um, again, I hope a lot of you know what Community Legislative Network is, um, but basically um, we are a superintendent's committee that is made up of representatives from all of the different stakeholders group within our district. Um, it's limited to really only about um, two to three uh, members of, so you know, parents, teachers, support staff, administrators, community members, um, and we work with a lobbyist um, that's hired by the school district to advocate for state public policy um, that, that benefits our uh, school district. And um, each fall, we develop a legislative agenda that kind of sets our, um, not really goals, just kind of like sets our um, kind of guidelines um, for the upcoming legislative session in January. And then, so we usually meet two times in the fall. We just had our first meeting uh, just this past Tuesday. And then during the legislative session, we meet every other week um, and just get updates um, as to what's going on with the bills. We track and follow all the bills and, and um, together collaborate on taking positions on each of the bills. And then we usually get a hot list of the ones that are most important. And there's all different types of ways that either through our lobbyists or um, through actions that we ask for you, we advocate for either supporting or opposing um, those bills that are um, being heard in committee. And then if they continue on um, through to the floors of one of the chambers. Um, so we basically use an email network to send out any of those updates. Um, sometimes it'll just be kind of an informational update. Sometimes it'll be a, you know, an action alert request. So, you know, please log on to request to speak, which we'll talk about later, or please email your legislators about this particular um, bill. And so in order to um, receive those emails, you can just email subscribe cln at gmail.com. And um, we, United Parent Council is kind enough to let us use um, their constant contact system to push those out, as well as to um, push some of that information out on social media. So um, make for sure that you're connected to United Parent Council's, you know, primarily Facebook page um, would be a good way to connect there too. And um, other than that, there's um, an email address to where you can reach me um, on the UPC website. It's one of the committees listed. So from the homepage, if you go up to the committees and then um, drop down to legislative, uh, you can get information there. Plus, there's a lot of great just basic voter information, um, where to, how to find out what legislative you, your district is. Um, once we have our election, we'll update that with who your new um, representatives are so you'll know uh, it's a kind of a one-stop shop from a legislative perspective so um that's the best way to really kind of stay plugged in um after we we get through the election so um let's see i thought i did see oh um and again so basically to become a committee member of, of cln it's through your from whatever stakeholder group that you it's kind of like any other committee from whatever stakeholder group you um, represent. It would be through the president of that organization. Um, and um, let's see, what else? Oh, thank you, Donna. Let's see, Rachel dropped that in. Um, okay. Anybody? I think that, that wraps it up for me unless there's any other questions. Thanks for hanging out late for any of those. Minutes. Sorry, we, we went over a little bit, but I think it's all good stuff, so.
Okay, well, thank you presenters and thank you all everyone for hanging in with us and we're going on this journey and I think this was one of the best panel discussions I've been to in a virtual setting. I think we had a lot of times where we all could uh, ask each other questions and um, share some really important helpful information. If you decide or realize you have some more questions, um, please contact us at UPC. We will try to get information for you, point you in the direction of where you can get those answers. Um, so we are here for you. We appreciate you. And Jessica, do you have anything to say in closing? Um, no, I just want to thank everyone. And I, I, I agree. I thought it was a really great, informative, uh, very timely conversation. So um, thank you to everyone who spoke tonight. Thank you for everyone who stayed on to listen. Um, I hope you'll check out our resource document that we put together. Um, it, it really is a great like kind of one stop shop spot for a lot of the information because I know there was so much that came out you came out you today. Um, and so I think a really great resource. Please feel free to share um, with your community as well. And thanks again to the presenters and Julie and Lisa and um, make sure you to, to go out and vote and we'll see everyone at our next meeting so thank you all so much